<coughs> well, good, good morning to everyone and uh, welcome to this workshop on post-normal science, uh, exploring collective accountability. Here there are many colleagues and friends, Dan Patton from uh, Illinois State University, uh, Jan Badminton from Birmingham in video conference, uh, Annibale Bigeri from University of Florence, Paola Zaratin, uh, our project leader in the Horizon 2020 multi-act uh, and uh, director of scientific research of FISM, Carlos Larinaga and uh, uh, a lot of, uh, uh, of friends. Uh, before to introduce uh, you, uh, Professor Fantovic, the protagonist of this workshop, I give the floor to Professor Bazzana, the head of the department for uh, an official welcome. Please, Flavio. So, thank you very much to be here. I'm very happy to find uh, a lot of people here and in video conference for this uh, first meeting uh, here in Trento of the Multi-Act project. Uh, so, I'm the head of the department, uh, so I just uh, welcome you, welcome uh, here in Trento and in our department. And uh, uh, I think that uh, you can have a, a good uh, day today and discuss uh, your interesting topic of accounting and accountability. So, thank you very much to be here and uh, welcome to be here in Trento and to start with this meeting. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm very honored to introduce you to introduce you, Professor Silvio Fantovic, the, the father of uh, post-normal science. He began his career uh, teaching mathematics, logic, and research methodologies in Buenos Aires and Argentina, and uh, uh, he left uh, uh, Argentina at the beginning of uh, the 80 years, uh, and. Uh, uh, he moved to, uh, to England, where he was a research fellow at the University of, uh, of Leeds. Until his retirement in 2011, he was a scientific officer uh, at the Joint Research Center ISPRA of the European Commission in, uh, in Italy. He is presently professor at the University of Bergen in Norway at uh, the Center for the Study of the Science uh, uh, and uh, the Humanities. Silvio is a philosopher of science, active in uh, the field of science and te technology studies, uh, and uh, he created the NUSAP, uh, uh, Notational System for Characterizing Uncertainty and Quality in uh, uh, Quantitative Expression. And uh, together with uh, Jan Ravitz, he introduced the concept of uh, post-normal science. And uh, the article, Science for the Post-Normal Age, is presently the most cited paper of the journal Futures. And another very important and inspiring paper uh, is the work of uh, Songbeard, Ecological Economics as a Post-Normal Science in uh, Ecological uh, Economies. So, I don't bother you again, and uh, uh, I give the floor to Silvio. Thank you, Silvio, to be here in Trento. Uh, thank you. I, I will say a few words in, in Italian, and then I will change to English, ok? Eh, eh, grazie per l'ospitalità, è un piacere eh, l'opportunità di parlare con voi oggi eh, all'Università di Trento. Eh, grazie también a los amigos de España y, y espero que sea útil para todos. Ok, eh, I will go there. Does it work? Yes. Good. Uh, yeah, I, I, I cannot do it from there, you see. I'm, uh, uh, I'm constrained at the podium. So I'll move. So if you come here, uh, I don't want to, you know, you want if you move, but I would prefer if you do it. Uh, so, uh, again, uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk with you about post-normal science. 
I, uh, in general, I, I don't assume that people know what post-normal science is. Okay? Uh, that will be uh, pretend too much in general. But uh, so, what I'll do is the following. I will, uh, uh, I have two hours, but two hours is a bit too much. I will divide it in two parts and just to have enough time to, to talk and then an interval in the middle. What I will do is first say a few words about post-normal science, okay? And then what I want you is to, in a sense, uh, be aware about what was the time and what is the intellectual history of the idea of post-normal science. Okay. Uh, in 1921, uh, Antonio Gramsci, which some of you might know, an Italian philosopher and politician, said uh, that history teaches, but there are no students. Uh, so, uh, I, I have to say that sometimes this is true, but we hope that it is not true, and he was wrong, that we can learn. So part of learning is to have memory of a certain trajectory, and post-normal science is part of that trajectory. Okay, so uh, the first thing is, you know, how relevant is it today, and why are we here? Well, everybody has read about a post truth society, about alternative facts, okay, about uh, questioning expertise, okay, about movements of anti-vaccine and flat earth. Okay? And, you know, now we are also producing gene-edited babies in order to colonize the stars because of an impending ecological disaster or catastrophe. So, how we lost our mind? Well, it's a good question. Eh? How we lost our mind? My answer is not really, eh? Eh, because all these things have the reasons. They are not something that appear just spontaneously. And I would say that post-normal science is all about these things. It's about what we are seeing now today that sometimes for many people is puzzling. And how do we reach that situation? Now, uh, here, this is our building at the, in Bergen, you know, yeah. and uh, the it's called the Center for the Study of the Sciences and the Humanities, SVT. In Norwegian, is a, a Wittenskapstheorie. For those who know German, immediately it's the Norwegian word for Wissenschaft. You see? There, unfortunately, there is no word in English that corresponds exactly to the notion of Wissenschaft. So, uh, when we translate it in, in, in English, we talk about sciences and humanities because the concept of Wissenschaft goes beyond scientific knowledge. Okay? And this is what we're trying to develop and this is what's all about in, in our center, what we call the double competency. Uh, people who know about science and know about the humanities, working as a whole. Okay? So, uh, I was told that it works, but uh, help? Okay. Uh, I, I get okay, I can do it if it works from here. Stuck. It is frozen. Sorry. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Here. Okay, 
Now, I will, as I say, I will say something very brief about post-normal science. Post-normal science substantially is what we call a mantra and a heuristic diagram. The mantra is written there. Facts are uncertain, values are in dispute, stakes are high, and decisions urgent. Okay? And uh, the idea is that you are confronted with a post-normal situation when those aspects are in place. And you can immediately see that these are not the conditions in which you do modern science. Okay? Is that clear? So these are not the conditions in which you do normal science. So, and so when you're in front of that, we argue that, in a sense, you have to bracket the notion of truth, which is the quest of modern science. And think of something different that we call then equality. And the diagram, which is, establishes a relation between systems uncertainty, the uncertainties of the system and the study, and what is at stake in the problem, establishes what is the, who does the quality assessment of the process and the product that goes as an input in a decision process. Is that clear? And what we argue is, as you move out from the, from the axis, the, the center, no, you know, uh, as we move out, the community of those assessing quality is increases. Right. Now, if you want to see more, you can look at the papers that were mentioned, the 93 paper is open and everything is available, and uh, uh, other, the articles in, in Wikipedia and in others. So you can see a bit more about the articulation of post-normal science. For many, post-normal science, uh, although now is, I have to say, quite popular, uh, 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 for us it's a big surprise. It's not new. Uh, the first, okay, yes, the next one. No, no, this one. This is the first article in which post-normals, the name post-normal science appears. It's from 1990 in a journal called Scientific European. Uh, for those who know Scientific American, this was the, uh, 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 something that came with a dish for Europe of the scientific American. And, uh, well, you can notice that uh, we, uh, we were young. I mean, uh, <laughs> uh, Jerry will be 90 uh, this year. So, uh, and this is uh, the first time that the name post-normal science appears. Uh, the next. But actually, the, it's almost 40 years since we have been working on post-normal science. Uh, at the a department of history and philosophy of science of the University of Leeds. And that's a, the original diagram. There's still the systems uncertainties and decisions takes, but the name post-normal science is not there. We had a different name. And, but as you see, this is a publication of 1985. So the work, uh, actually, when I presented this in a conference, it was 82 or 83. And it, it unveils the origin of post-normal science, which is on the study of risks. Uh, for those who are familiar, uh, you know the relation between our contemporary society and risks is important. And Ulrich Beck, a German sociologist, called it the risk society. Okay? So the study of risks was very important. And it was embedded into something that was called at that time the acceptability of risks. 
In other words, how do we make citizens to accept a techno-scientific innovation? We are in a department of economics. Uh, so uh, the first, so you are students, those students are students of economics, I suppose, or something related to that. The first time that uh, risks, the word risks as a technical concept appears is in economics. Someone knows it? From where? Okay, it's interesting. This is why I say it's important history and the memory. Eh? It, it was, uh, appears in a book of 1921 by an American economist called Frank Knight. And the book is called Risk, Uncertainty, and Profit. So the whole purpose of the book is to explain why in investment or in, in, in stocks and so on, some people win and some people lose. And the idea is all about the distinction between risk and uncertainty. Okay? And uh, substantially for Knight, for Frank Knight, risk is like a quantified uncertainty. And this is qu quantified through the use of probabilities. Okay? So you could say that risk is a quantified uncertainty, but there are things that are uncertain. And this is how Knight explains why some people win and some people lose in the economic process. Okay. Now, what is interesting is that at the same year, there was another economist that wrote a very important book related to this, and that was John Maynard Keynes. You know Keynes, I suppose. Okay. What was the book that Keynes wrote in 1921? It was called A Treatise of Probability. And there he proposes a different interpretation of the notion of probability. And it is in terms of betting odds. Uh, someone plays with the, the horses, I mean gambles with the horses, you know, the bettings, and, and you get the betting odds, no? Uh, in terms of uh, your, you know. So Keynes argue that you can interpret probabilities, the mathematics of probabilities, uh, I don't want to go into the technical details, but yeah, in terms of betting odds. And he said, British people like to bet on horses, and therefore they are quite skilled in understanding betting, betting odds. And that's a, a very legitimate interpretation of probabilities. Now, the question I'm leaving for you is, 1921, you have these two things. Eh? A, a night, distinguishing between uncertainty and, and risks, and a, a Keynes with this idea that you can call personal probabilities. So what happens when you substantially can quantify a situation of uncertainty, like in betting horses? That's the distinction between risk and certainty continues, but that's a different. I would need a full course on probability in order to develop that. I will not do it here. But you know, what's interesting is that a, a, since its origin, probability was related to gambling. Eh? Related to gambling. That goes to the origin and the emergence of probabilities as mathematics. Okay? Because the origin of probability is not in mathematics or in science or in gambling, but it's in theology and law. Probability meant plausible or generally accepted by the church. Okay? It's in the 17th century where it develops as a mathematics, as a mathematical process, and this is related to gambling. People wanted to know Bernoulli, Fourier, they wanted to know how to win in the, you know, playing roulette or cards or dice, it's things like that. This is the origin. Right. So, uh, the risks, as I say, the acceptability of risk situation is really what today, and I think in the project, multi-act, is related to, if I read it correct, related to what we call responsible research of in, and innovation, you know. So, 
Uh, this is the interesting relation. Because have you thought why we should have responsible research and innovation today? And that's an important label from the European Commission at, in age 2020. And why is it? When you say respons research, uh, responsible research and innovation, you mean that there is research and innovation that is not responsible. <laughs> it's clear. No, you don't have to be a, you know, a, a, a fire event or Foucault in order to understand that. <laughs> uh, uh, and that's precisely an interesting point. The question is, since when we believe that research and innovation can't be responsible? And it is quite recent. And it goes back precisely to the time of the acceptability of risk. The idea that if you tell people what are the risks, you put them quantitatively, and you tell them that the risks are very low in terms of probabilities, then people rationally should accept the risks. But that was contested. So, is that clear? Up to here, it's so clear. Okay, now, and as you see, eh, the relation between risks and uncertainty that Knight established, and it's usually you do it in environmental and resource economics, etc. You, you know. Uh, uh, this distinction. And the idea that perhaps when you have personal probabilities and all the rest, this distinction, and we transform every uncertainty in risk and therefore quantify, therefore predict, therefore control, and therefore manage, which is the Cartesian formula. Car the car, the idea that with techno scientific advancement, what you can do is precisely that. Quantify, predict, control, and manage. Because, as Descartes would put it, this is the destiny of humankind, to be the masters of nature. So you see how it goes back to the beginning of modernity, this idea. Up to here, it is OK. Now, uh, it's all, when we were walking up to here, say, well, when was the Council of Trento? 15? Council of Trento? 1525? When was it in Trento? Okay. Well, and that's, uh, okay, uh, interesting. Well, you can look it in Wikipedia or whatever. But substantially, it's well, almost more than a century before uh, Westphalia. You know what happened in Westphalia? It's interesting, you see memory. In Westphalia, which is 1650, 16, something like that, I can't remember exactly, and it doesn't matter really, but it was about that time, it was the emergence of the modern sovereign state. And that, that was at the end of all the wars, that succession wars, that were around, you know, where Europe was, uh, you know, devastated by war, by famine, and by pest, disease. That's another story, and I won't go into that at this time. But substantially, after Westphalia, is the origin of the European modern state that now is the is like a model of a modern contemporary state. And a couple of things happened there. But one of the consequences of the modern sovereign state is the creation of statistics. Now, for those, perhaps, you haven't thought about that, but statistics is the has to do with the state eh? and the relation with the probabilities starts around the 1700. The first book of statistics was 1650, I think, by an Englishman called Petty, 
and he wrote a book called Political Arithmetic. In other words, governance by numbers. Okay? So this is how strong. The idea that statistics and immediately every sovereign state created an office of statistics in order to quantify uh, the situation, the state of the state. Okay? The association with mathematics comes, uh, with probability comes later, as I say, when probability develops from gambling and all the rest. But, you see, and now at the European Union we have Eurostat, which does exactly the same thing, as an example. So that's the importance that you have in this type of idea. That you can credibly represent the world and the state numerically. And you might say at this stage, what's all about? But anyway, I'll tell you. You listen to my story. And this idea that you can represent the world by a nature, by numbers, and of course the state as part of it, has a long history in, in our civilization. You can go back to the Greeks. I don't want to do that. So what I'll go back is to Galileo. Come on. Yeah, here, to Galileo. I uh, suppose that <laughs> you recognize Galileo. And, and that's a book in 1623. Galileo said that the book of the universe is written in mathematical symbols. And unless you understand those symbols, you are like a blind person in a maze. You know the paragraph. Good. Uh, so this is the idea. As I say, it was not unique by a Galileo, but that was the idea, right? Now, remember I mentioned that at the beginning when I was talking about post-normal science that I talked about the truth, no? the quest for truth, which was part of the quest of modernity. But I also mentioned quality there and uncertainty, or deep uncertainty. These people were very clever. They understood that uncertainty was a problem for achieving truth. Right? So, it, <laughs> and this is why I started with the idea of post-truth, which is a rather, I feel, a rather banal type of understanding of a situation. Because substantially here we are not talking about a relation between what we say and how the world is, which is the Aristotelian definition of you, there is no such a thing as truth outside of what we say. The relation between a statement we make and a reality out there. Right. So, it, they understood that there was a problem in just finding the truth through the new emerging science, this, uh, and that was uncertainty. So he, why there was uncertainty? Okay. Uh, she is my clock. Uh, uh, yes. Okay. Uh, so, why there is uncertainty? It's a good question, eh? It's a good question. So, according to the tradition coming from Greece, and that Descartes uh, and Galileo adopted, is that we are responsible for uncertainty. Out there, there is no uncertainty, okay? So, we, is our perceptions 
that create uncertainty. Okay? And Galileo eh, eh, does it wonderful eh, with his idea of primary and secondary qualities. It's not, eh, you can look at it from Descartes, you can look at it from Plato on, Protagoras and all the rest, uh, and you will have it. And the idea is that uh, and he expresses quite nicely, uh, I don't have a feather, unfortunately. Uh, feathers are... <laughs> so, I have a piece of paper. Okay. And Galileo says, well, if I do this with a feather on my beard, it tickles. Okay. It's not important for science. And he said, no, that's not important because it tickles me. If this is white, if I see this white, is this important for science? And he says, no, that's not important because I see it white. And you can follow the reasoning. So it's what is filtered by our senses can be uncertain. Okay? But out there, there are those quantified extensive qualities, which he called uh, uh, primary qualities, that are not affected by our senses. You would say length, eh? or, or mass, and so on. He said those are the important for science. Okay? And on the basis of that distinction, he separates, he separates what's important, the primary qualities, what's not important, secondary qualities, which are the cause of uncertainty. So if we can do that, separate, and science does that, then we don't have uncertainty. And we can achieve the truth. Is that important? OK. So in terms of economic terms, you will say that he has a double externality. We are ex an externality to the subject we are studying. And you can isolate the system you are studying from the rest of, of the universe, of the, big, of the whole. Assuming that that system you are studying is separated from us, and that means it's objective, it's value-free, and all the rest. And you can assume that the system you are studying is almost stable and almost isolated. Therefore, it's not affected by time or by the relations with the other elements outside the system. And so he invents modeling. Okay? And the modern scientific method by doing that. I don't want to go into the details immediately, right? but this is how it starts. Okay? This is how it starts, and it continues, this idea. So with that, uh, you have a method to eliminate uncertainty, OK? Now, what, uh, <laughs> if I had a lot of time, I would talk about another philosopher who was, was fundamental for the uh, development of the modern state, which was David Hume, which has become rather fashionable these days, because Hume also had the problem of uncertainty, and in a different way. The problem of tr true I know, is related to the distinction between the true and the good. And the true was the facts, dealt with the facts. And the good dealt with the values. And I suppose you all are familiar with this distinction between facts and values. It's everywhere. And with Galileo and Descartes and all that, what they try to do is to separate facts from values. Okay, so, uh, and, but Hume called them differently. They call it, he called them reason and passion. Reason related to facts, passion related to values. And Hume said something that is, again, you need a, a full course for that. Said, reason is a slave of the passion, and it cannot be otherwise. Okay. Uh, but I was, why was it important, these things? Because that's the 
basis of legitimacy of the modern state. The, modern, the big intellectual innovation of the European modern sovereign state was the idea that you have a co-legitimacy system, a dual legitimacy system, one for facts and one for values. And for facts, you develop science, who pr providing the facts. And for the values, you develop what we call today the governance institutions, that eventually gave us a parlamentary system, democracy as we understand, and all the rest. The, assu the assumption that these two things come together, they are harmonious because of the relation between the truth and the good, which if you go back to Pythagoras, extend it also to beauty, truth, good, and beauty. They were part of the same whole. Okay, now, uh, so, uh, next one. Okay, so, this is a simple way of how Galileo and today we, re we solve problems. Okay. Um, the, uh, that goes back to a book by Jerry Rabbits of 71 called Scientific Knowledge is Social Problem and relates to the problem solving, solving strategy of the modern state. You have a political practical problem what you do is to reduce it as a technical problem. You solve the technical problem and you say, yes, we have solved the practical political problem. You can recognize this as everywhere. And the argument is that this doesn't work. When you are in a situation, I, the mantra, remember? This is not the condition of, can we go to the next one? But this is where powerful, and with this I will finish this very fast. Very, very powerful. And this is from, as you see, 1627, Francis Bacon. He wrote a science fiction short novel called The New Atlantis. Eh? You'll find it in Wikipedia or in, on, online. Look at what he, sa he says. Techno-scientific progress will take us to that. The prolongation of life, the restitution of life, the relation of age, the curing diseases, mitigation of pain. I mean, you read it oh, today, everywhere, oh, with all the techno-scientific promises. It's just, uh, it's just uh, artificial manners, you see. Even divination, he says divination. Oh, I cut it. Okay, uh, because he talks about divination. Well. Uh, Artificial intelligence with algorithms, uh, uh, machine learning is precisely divination in terms of, uh, of Francis Bacon. So, you can see how our contemporary world has been shaped by these extraordinary people. So, I will have a, a short uh, break. Unless you want to continue, it's up to you. I, I just can't continue to talk. I mean, you want to stop or you want to go a bit further? We can go. Okay. Okay. Right. Eh, next one. Okay. Here we have the last person, and then we will do a fast forward. I can promise you. No more history. Past the history. Okay, but these are important. This is uh, another aristocrat called uh, Cari uh, Condorcet. Someone has heard about Condorcet? Okay, uh, in economics, he was one of the first to work on preferences and ranking of preferences. And he developed what we call today multi criteria methods, right? And uh, so Condorcet is remembered by that, but also uh, because he invented progress. <laughs> before, uh, before Condorcet, nobody thought seriously about progress. But uh, Condorcet, who uh, thought that, uh, uh, you know, 
sketch for its historical picture of the progress of a human spirit. Very important book. Because he argued there is no such a thing as techno-scientific progress without moral progress. Remember what I said about responsible research of innovation? It's precisely that. For Condorcet, for Bacon, for Descartes, there was no research and innovation that was not responsible. And why? Because precisely of this. Because research and innovation, techno-scientific progress, was associated to moral progress. And he uses the question, I didn't develop that, but he uses the, Malthus the Malthusian question. You know what is the Malthusian problem? The idea that overpopulation will, uh, will create a problem for uh, uh, the, the food allocation. Okay? So he said that's not... That's a badly formulated problem because we will be able to anticipate the problem and because we are superior human beings because of techno-scientific progress, we'll avoid that. Well, tell that today. Eh? Look at all the problems about emissions about, and all the rest. You can imagine. And, uh, and according to Condorcet, that could not be possible because we, as superior human moral beings, will understand and anticipate the problem and avoid it. So for <laughs> Condorcet, there was no need to add another R to RI. So the question becomes, when did it change? that now can easily say, oh, there is the need to add responsible to research and innovation. Okay. Questions? Okay, you continue. Let go. Yeah. Well, you can go. I, I already mentioned this. Ah, yes, here. Okay. When did it change? We go uh, fast forward to the end of the Second World War. You see, it, it, we are doing right. It's, we fly over history. And someone knows this report. It's called Science, the Endless Frontier. Someone who can associate this with something. The endless frontier. It reminds you of something? Growth. No. <laughs> the enterprise. Eh? The enterprise. Is the endless goes to the endless frontier. It is this when science becomes an enterprise. Star Trek. Precisely. Is no longer extending the conquest of in the in, in Earth, in the Earth of the you know, like the conquest of the West in the US and so on. It's now the conquest of, of everything without end. And so it, 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 this is a report that Van Ever Bush prepared for the president of the US, 1945. You see, after the end of the Second World War, and uh, the idea is that science and technology become the main engines of progress, economic growth, jobs, and the rest. This is the time. And this is where science starts to grow. Imagine what was science in Europe in between the wars. Small laboratories of... Uh, of white men of around my age that all knew each other, okay? With the exception of Marie Curie. Which, uh, but uh, anyway, uh, it was like that. And suddenly, this changes after the war. And why did it change? Why did they thought that science and technology could become the main engine of economic growth 
and the rate of power. Why? Any idea? No? Well, because of science contribution to the effort of the war, which was is somehow important. But remember that all science and modern science, and even before, was always associated with war. Galileo and, you know, Leonardo, when he wanted to find someone to, you know, to sponsor him, he sent a letter to the prince, you know, or the nobility, and he, first of all, what he mentioned are his achievements in the art, in, in, in war engineering. And the last sentence he said, well, I know how to paint, okay? The money was not coming, his sponsor, they were not coming for painting. They were coming for efforts, war efforts, engineering. Oh, no. so, uh, so, that's, so we're, I will mention first three achievements of science in the Second World War. The first is quite easy, the nuclear bomb, Project Manhattan, okay? That one. The second uh, is Alan Turing, the beginning of computers and uh, code breaking. Okay? You know that uh, in Wrigley Park, uh, the, uh, Alan Turing and his team decoded the German Enigma code. Okay? Just I have to say it because now it's becoming politically correct to say it. Alan Turing was gay, had a terrible problems, and there was a picture, a, a film recently about that. But the other element that's not mentioned usually is who were the people working for, for Turing? Women. You know, men were in the army. So women were the, the main ta force of, of Turing. The code breakers, the mathematicians, and all the rest. I think it's important to say. So that's the second contribution. And the third contribution was the, <laughs> was, uh, perhaps, again, do you know what operational research is? Decision theory, perhaps, no, it's important. That comes from, from uh, uh, Norbert Wiener and, and, and uh, Johnny von Neumann working on the problem of transport, transportation which was fundamental for sending troops and materials from the States to Europe occupied. Okay? So these three things convinced uh, 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 Vannevar Bush and the whole government that that was the way to go. So it was all romance, I mean. Science, technology, and the state. Not only that, uh, uh, but the idea you know, Karl Popper, perhaps some of you know him, uh, but Karl Popper was important not because of his work on, on research methodology, the falsification idea, but because of the work on the open society, okay? The open society, liberal democracy. And Robert K. Merton, also sociologist, they identified science with liberal democracy. So the idea that unless you were in a liberal democracy, you couldn't do science. And there are examples I don't want to go, but this is all part of the story. A part of the story. Sometimes it could be good to do the story a bit more in detail, but today we can't continue. The imitation, the film. Okay, can we go to the Okay, okay, when things start to go wrong, and as I say, the 60s, at the beginning of the 60s, everything changes. And, you know, it's be even before the hippies and make love and peace and not war and all the rest, that's before. This is what I would call the first populist manifesto. in today's language. And that was President Eisenhower. Uh, some people, again, memory and history, some people 
don't even remember when I left you, who was Eisenhower. I was, I'm so old that I saw Eisenhower. <laughs> yeah. in, a, in, a, in a city in Argentina called uh, Mar del Plata, he came to a meeting of the Organization of American States. And I was young and I saw it. My mother took me to see it. Anyway, uh, uh, Eisenhower, you, you know, in the U.S., there is, a fair, fair, there is a speech in January that all the presidents give, the speech to the nation. And this was his last one before he left office. You know, in January, there is the change. And this is, as I said, the populist manifesto because, first of all, everybody was surprised by what he said. And actually, not many Americans remember it. Coming from a Republican, a general, but he was called himself a dumb person, you know. Although he was the, he, the chief of the um, uh, Allied armies that defeated Nazi Germany. So he contributed to the creation and development of what it was called the industrial military complex. But like he says, oh, we have to be careful with this industrial military complex. And then what is interesting for us here, and show why I call it a, is, you know, look at the first paragraph. He says, the solitary inventor tinkering in his shop has been task force of scientists in laboratories at testing field. So, it's no longer the, Ameri the European University in between the wars, okay? In, ca in laboratories in Cambridge or, you know, working with, with string and, uh, and, you know, and walks and things as they say they used to do. Now it's big task force of scientists. All the result of Vannevar Bush. Second, the free university, exactly. He talks about the fundamental change in universities. He says, it's no longer the fountainhead but of free ideas and scientific discovery, but now, because it depends on funding, and funding comes from government or from industry. Okay? And, and you recognize clearly this process. He already anticipated it in 61. And then he says, uh, uh, the me changes in methods. We don't have old blackboards anymore. We have the new computers. Okay. And that was 61. And if you think about it, uh, after that, you create computer power and you develop what is called simulation models and systems analysis. So what he says then is the important point for us, where he ch uh, changed the mind. He says, citizens, beware, because public policy can become captive of the scientific technological elite. And once you see that, you realize that some of the things that you hear around today are precisely already anticipated by, by Eisenhower in 61. Now, fast. The fact that things changed, you can see because immediately in 1962, there are a couple of very important points that just develop ideas that are implicit in Eisenhower's message. 1962, Thomas Kuhn, book, The Structure of the Scientific Revolutions. I think some of you know. Uh, I don't want to enter into details, but substantially he criticizes the idea of a linear progress in science. Okay? So that's the critique of progress continue in science. And then another very important book, very important book, that was the Silent Spring. Do you know Silent Spring? Rachel Carson's book. Rachel Carson's book creates the environmental movement. Okay? Creates the environmental movement. Before 
1962, the environment didn't exist. It was nature. So she creates the environmental movement with the idea about the pathologies of the use of technoscience in agriculture. So she questions this idea about progress, technological progress and its effects. So that changes the imaginary of people. And the activist environment starts from there. Then in 1953, there is another book, less known, but very influential. The author is a Derek De Sola Price. I will write everything if you want later. OK, Derek De Sola Price. Have you heard of Derek De Sola Price? OK, it's interesting. You haven't heard of someone who determines your job prospects. Because he invented citation index, impact factors, and all the rest. Now, uh, he writes a book called Little Science, Big Science. Oh, Yes, it was. Little science, big science. And you see the transition in Barnier Bar Bush. Little science, big science. There are some interesting details around that that I don't have time, but if you are interested, you can look at it. One is that uh, the word big science was invented in 61 by Alvin Weinberg, uh, which I don't know if I will have time to mention later. The second is that there were two people who wrote the introduction to the book, the foreword. One was, I mentioned already, uh, Merton, and this idea of science and democracy. Okay. And the other was a guy called Eugene Garfield. And Eugene Garfield was the creator of science metrics and the citation index. Okay. So, those three books mention what is the problem. In particular, th the Sola Prize says there is this growth in science. It's not only the big enterprise of science as such, but also the, the idea that they have so many publications and papers, which is something that you know today. And he says, this growth cannot continue like that. One of the consequences that led to the creation of the citation index was like the following. In little science, everybody knew each other. So there was no need to peer review, really. John Maddox, the famous editor of Nature, he created the, famous of, the fame of Nature, he just smelled the paper because he knew the authors, and he, he didn't even send them to peer review. It's in the <coughs> history of nature. So really, when you have a mass of a scientist scattered all over the world that nobody knows who they are, is you need some other more formal method of quality control. And here comes the story about quality. So from being a personal relation becomes a formal quantitative structure. In other words, a bureaucratizer with all the problems. When we talk today about the problems of peer review, of citation, perverse incentives, and all that is precisely anticipated by them. And the changes in the political economy of science. Okay. So, a couple more things. OK. OK. Uh, so this is the state of the situation in, in the 60s, plus the, plus the coming into everyday life of complex techno-scientific systems, the first of which was uh, nuclear power. And, as I mentioned, the idea of risk, acceptability of risks, etc., etc. Okay? And contestation. Because it's clear that in this climate of, you know, contestation, 
of change, where you put, uh, you, you problematize this idea of progress. Is it worth it? Look what's doing to us, eh? and so on and so forth. Then it becomes uh, also discussed publicly all these technical instruments that are being deployed in order to justify and legitimate the acceptability of risks. Go ahead. Uh, you are. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, yes. Go, 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 go. Yeah. Okay. This I mentioned Alwin Weinberg. He invented, uh, he invented uh, uh, the yeah, label Big Science in 61. But this is a very important paper. Uh, for those of you who were born recently, <laughs> uh, 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 you know, this is what, what this was called is a page of the citation index when it was not on the internet. Pre-internet times, you had a citation. Those who are old enough will remember. And that was a classic entry by Alwin Weinberg, and it was called Science and Transcience. And uh, uh, as I say, he was the creator of the label Big Science. He was also a very important person in the establi American establishment. He was an engineer, nuclear in in a physicist, and he participated in the Manhattan Project. Okay, so the problem he had to solve, remember the context? Uh, you, yes, Manhattan Project was the one that created the nuclear bomb. Um, Bruna gives me a sabbath, because perhaps some of you don't know the relation between the Manhattan Project and the nuclear bomb. Anyway, the project was the creation of the bomb. Okay, so, uh, uh, and he, his problem was as follows. If the relation between, in this case, nuclear power system, uh, working normally, we are not talking about accidents, and health effects. Not health, I think it was environmental and health. But anyway, his problem was, can we show scientifically the consequences of a nuclear power station operating as designed in a routine form and health and environmental effects. And his conclusion is that we can't. And that has to do with levels of confidence, experiment power, and all, all the rest. I don't want to go into, but you can read it. It's openly available. So he says, and that's important, for the first time, and remember the, remember that slide when I say practical political problem and a, a technical problem. He says there are problems that you can express scientifically, but you cannot solve scientifically. And that's the definition of what he calls transcience. So, what's interesting of this? Can you hit another one? Let's see. Yeah, per perfect. Uh, what this citation in this is a beautiful work, actually, uh, gives the opinion of two other important people, establishment in the U.S. One is uh, Harvey Brooks, who at that time uh, came to Europe, and it was a creation, it was called the YASA, International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis in Laksa. That's important because it was the time where the people from the East and the West met. You know, remember there was the iron court in uh, and all that. So there was a place where all met. And the idea that they created were the first main pr uh, proponents of systems analysis. And it was related to energy, energy project. So he said, well, there is another trans-scientific enterprise, and it's precisely systems analysis. Because he says, from the times of Poincaré, we know that a complex systems of equation, differential equation, has no solution. Harvey Brooks. And then there was the other one, which is uh, Ruckelshaus, who was twice head of EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, he was also chair of head of e FBI, 
but he was a clever person. And he wrote a book called Risk, Science, and Democracy. And here the terms are all together. And he says, during my time at EPA, most of the problems were scientific, trans-scientific. You can express them scientifically, but you cannot solve them scientifically. OK? Is that clear? So we are at a situation where the whole structure, framework of problem solving in a dual legitimacy a civilization, society, comes into question. Is that, there are questions about this. You know, you have to think that with this dual legitimacy, it's very important. Think about today. It's not enough for science to provide an input to the process of decision making. There has to be a democratic consensus or agreement around it, too. So what's the problem? What happens when these two things are in conflict? So you recognize today when we are talking about, uh, about post-truth, about alternative facts, about fake news, about uh, you know, anti-vaccine movements, and you say, oh, you, there is no way in which you give them more facts. Some people, mm, no, or flat earth. We thought, well, I mean, it's a growing movement, you know. And all these conspiracy theories, you go around, all these have been promoted and helped by a, a, a technology, by enabling technology. So what you have is, this is really where you see the, the germs that start to infect the whole. I'm using infect in a, don't take it as a pejorative term, but changes this relationship. And explains what we have today. It's not. That starts. Where a whole legitimate story becomes controversial. And you think that it enters into contradiction. All the aims of research and innovation and the aims and goals of a democratic society, diverse democratic society, come into conflict. Is that so? Uh, that was the time where we start to work. <laughs> there are a couple of more things that I have to mention which are important. At that time, also, what you have is it starts with uh, Aníbal, is the expert on the subject, is what it was called a popular epidemiology, what it was called housewife epidemiology in the US. The name housewife comes from Louis Gibbs in a place called Love Canal, where there was contamination. I don't want to the story, but you can read it. And substantially what you have is that the accredited experts and administrators say there was no problem about children were getting ill, and the authorities say everything is okay. So uh, Louis Gibbs, who was a mother housewife in Love Canal, starts to investigate. And she gets with a couple of people, uh, one a statistician, Beverly Page, and, and a, a journalist, a geneticist, and start working, and they discover alternative facts. The alternative facts is that there was a relation. This is why I'm saying uh, have to be careful. And it was not only that. You can just have a story warm. Come, starts a movement of people doing epidemiology from the community. So scientists not only lost the trust of official science, but also there was a, a, an alternative way of building science that there is a trajectory that tra 
takes today to what we can call citizen science. Okay. okay. Uh, we'll do a break because Bruna says I should have a break. And, and the, Let's do a break, and then we'll fi and then we'll open. I, I arrive to post-normal science briefly, and then we can start the conversation. Really, thank you. Thank you. <laughs>